Good morning. Let's join in a song to begin our worship this morning. To God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. So come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Great things He has taught us, great things He has done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He had done. Listen to Psalm 18. You'll recognize these words. 19, rather. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day after day pours forth speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. And the Bible talks about how all creation joins in praising God. And then the writer ends that psalm by saying, So let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's who we're here to worship today. Would you take a moment just to, to stand and say hello to someone and welcome them? to this time of worship. Let's pray together as we call ourselves to worship. Thank you so much, Lord, for this day you've given, for the beauty of this weekend, for um, all the many reasons we have to give thanks to you, for crops maturing, for every sign of your care for us. And we gather today to, to honor you and lift you up and, and give thanks to you. And we gather to, today to, to place our faith in you and to trust you deeply. Help us, Lord, to do so not only during this gathered time, but as we're dispersed this week. May we live every moment to your glory. And will you fill this place now and fill our lives with your presence. Help us to be open to everything you say to us today and to find direction and to find peace and to find encouragement in Christ our Savior, we pray in his name. Amen. Okay, we should have our team up here. <laughs> and uh, we're going to um, continue to worship with some songs of praise and... Uh, the first one is, is especially for today because we're going to look at a passage of scripture that, that reminds us that we'll go through some pretty deep waters sometimes in life and, and sometimes things don't, don't all go the way that we'd like to see them go and, and we struggle with that, excuse me, but as we struggle with that, God is always good. God is good, uh, maybe you've heard it said all the time and uh, there isn't, there isn't a single time that God's not good. And so this, this song uh, lifts up that truth. And, uh, 
and acknowledges that when uh, the Lord gives and when the Lord takes away alike, uh, the Lord is good and we say, blessed be your name, Lord. So let's worship together. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful when your streams are well and full. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk to the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, sound be your name down on me, by the world shall that it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, a gold part with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll take back to grace. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Uh, before we sing this next song to thank the Lord and, uh, and to bless his name maybe think of some things he's done for you this past week and uh, lift him up and give him glory Call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I
Place upon the deepest waters Your sovereign hand Will be my guide Where deep may fail your face around me You never fail And you won't start for us when our feet may fail we're going to open his word in, in a few moments and see a beautiful example of how the apostle Paul felt so cared for no matter what and may that be our story as well please be seated
him I am going, and never more from him to depart. Oh, yet sweeter as the days go by. for the children's message. How are you doing today? Good. Good, good. Does anybody know what these are? Necklaces. Necklaces. Do you know what kind of bead that is? Pearl. Pearl. That's right, that's a pearl. Do you know how pearls are made? Anybody know how they're made? No. Well, I'll tell you. They come from this. This is an oyster. And oysters have a pretty hard shell that protects them, but every now and then, a little tiny, tiny grain of salt gets inside, and it hurts, and it irritates that oyster. And so God has provided a way for the oyster to get through that pain. He produces a fluid that kind of just oozes around that little grain of salt. And it gets hard, and the oyster does it over and over and over again until it doesn't hurt anymore. And then that stuff that oozes out and goes around and covers that grain of sand over and over again becomes something very beautiful. It becomes a pearl, just like these. And that's kind of how it is with God. Sometimes we have stuff in our lives that's painful, that hurts, and if we ask, God will let his love just ooze around and through us to help us get through that pain and through that hurt. And a lot of times, those things, the Bible tells us that those kind of troubles produce perseverance and character. Sometimes when we go through those tough times, we come out a much more beautiful person. And I'm not talking about on the outside like the pearl is beautiful. I'm talking about on the inside. So when you have troubles in your life, try to remember how about that oyster and how that special fluid oozes around and protects him, helps him get through that hurt and produces something beautiful in the same way God can use the things in your lives that are hurtful and hard to produce the character and make you a beautiful person in Christ. And that's what we all want to be, right? We want to be the best that God wants us to be. So let's pray today. Lord, we thank you so much that your love is so available to us and that in all the bad and hard times that you're there for us, letting your love just ooze around us and help us through those tough times. Help us to never forget that you are always there. And we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's kids said. Amen. Amen. You can go to Children's Church. <coughs>
so we've been looking at uh, the tough stuff, right? Uh, the la last week, this week. Um, next week you get a break from that because I have to preach down in Waupon for the, on a classes assignment. And then we're going to come back the last week of the month and actually look at the biblical reality of, of hell, of, of eternal punishment. And what do we believe about that in, in, a, in a day when a lot of people are kind of questioning because it's such a hard doctrine. And, and really all the things we're looking at are hard. Last week we looked at the depth of sin, but we also saw the wonder then of salvation. So when we see the mess we're really in, we realize the grace of God coming through that. And today, uh, we're going to take a, light, a brief look at some of the difficulties of life. How, how do you face life when um, you're a, a victim of something like a hurricane, like so many people were, especially in Haiti, such a poor country already? And, and then they're just devastated. How, how do you do that as a believer? How do you understand that? Or uh, if, if you've been told you're ill and you pray and pray and pray for a cure and then, and then no earthly cure comes, what do, what do you do with that? Or uh, if you have a loved one that you care so much for and, 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 and you just, the relationship is not mutual and, and you wonder why and you, you cry out to God for, for answers. So let's look at what Paul says to some people in Corinth long ago, and, and then we're going to apply some of this to the things we struggle with every day. Hear the word of the Lord through the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth and writing to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body, so then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I've spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So how do you face life when these kinds of troubles come your way? There are not many things more certain in life than that you are going to suffer. And people around you will suffer disease and disaster and deep disappointments. And when you do, when you do, it's natural to ask the question, why me? Why am I going through this? Many people think pain is the exception to the rule for Christians, or ought to be. When hardship hits, sometimes they feel as though God has deserted them. Have you ever felt that way? Or, or maybe that God isn't as dependable as they thought, or maybe God's angry with them about something. In reality, though, the world is sin-broken, 
And until God finishes setting everything straight, people suffer the effects. And God even allows some Christians to die as martyrs for the faith. And he allows others to survive but undergo terrible persecution. And, and our natural gut reaction is to say, why? Well, Paul is writing to some Jesus followers in Corinth a long time ago, and he's facing a personal challenge. In fact, he's facing a personal attack as he writes this. And the church is facing a challenge as well from some people who are saying, we should expect a better life from God. Leaders like Paul, if their faith was really exemplary, if they were really people we should look up to, they should be demonstrating more of the victory of being in Jesus. If, if, if Paul's really called the way we think he is, then why is he struggling so much? And, and believers should look to the Lord to make them stronger and healthier and wealthier. And so Paul touches on some of the harsh realities of life, even life in Jesus. And he defended his own reputation and the health of the church as well by rooting both in a biblical view of suffering. And he says it all starts with this image. And here's where everything falls apart because I have a little clay pot in my office that I was going to have with me today. So use your imagination and pick, picture just, you know, a rough, earthy clay pot about this big in the palm of my hand. And that's what Paul says he is, a jar of clay, right? We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power, it really is there, there really is power, but it's from God and, and not from us. He said we have this amazing treasure of the gospel, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that will raise our bodies one day to be with him forever, the power to give new life in Christ, the power to transform people from the inside out to change like nothing else can change. He said, it's amazing, the power of God to redeem. And we have, and God puts this treasure, God puts this immeasurable treasure into chipped, leaking, unattractive, frail jars of clay. And that's us. That's you. That's me. That's the church of Jesus Christ. Clay jars were roughly the equivalent of margarine tubs or other throwaway plastic containers, the kind my wife washes out and puts in the, the storage bin drawer and the kind that when she's gone, I take and throw in the garbage or the recycling. <laughs> <laughs> Their lifespan in the ancient world was at best a few years. And Paul was saying, he wasn't much to look at. He was admitting it. He was saying, no, 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 I'm, I'm not going to argue that I'm greater than you think I am. He says, I, I, right, I'm not much to look at. The church is not much to look at. They were not going to impress anyone with themselves. They were not going to look strong and rich and capable all of the time. They were simple. They lacked resources. And... and uh, human resources at least, and they were undertaking a lot of things without a clue of how to succeed except to trust Jesus. Nor were their lives easy since meeting the Savior. He wants us to know that, that that's the normal for him. In fact, he says it gets tough sometimes when you do follow Jesus. For instance, he says, we're under pressure we are hard pressed on every side. He's describing the life of himself and, and, and his friends and he's saying, he's using a term that was used for crushing grain between millstones or smashing grapes in a wine press. And he was saying, I'm like one of those grapes and the pressure is on and I'm just about to burst sometimes because I'm under so much pressure. Despite the fact that I'm a follower of Jesus. Back in chapter 1, he, he says he'd been under pressure far beyond his human ability to endure, apart from God's grace. And so there were some teachers in Corinth who suggested Paul was not living in the victory God intended. Surely God wouldn't willingly put his children through this stuff. 
And preachers down through the centuries have suggested that uh, you're missing something, you're settling for less than God's intent if the Lord doesn't heal you or put a gold ring on your finger or a Mercedes in your garage. Usually they have gold rings on their fingers and Mercedes in their garages. <laughs> Funny, says Paul, that, that's not my experience. He says, that's not my experience. God is good. And miracles still happen. And people are transformed. And sometimes people are wonderfully healed. But Jesus never promises to take all the pressure away. Following Jesus might just put us under more pressure. And there's something right and healthy about expecting that. And if that's not enough, try on this one. Sometimes we're just plain perplexed, he says. The people who thought that they were better to follow than Paul had a lot of answers. But instead of defending himself against that in, in kind, he says, you know, you're right. We don't have all the pat answers. His opponents would never admit to being confused because they might lose the respect of their audience, but that's not the kind of respect Paul was looking for. They thought Paul, too, had, had better be the man with the answers. Otherwise, maybe he's not fit to lead. So instead of defending himself, Paul confesses that he's bewildered sometimes. That he's at his wits. Sometimes at a complete loss about what comes next. And he hasn't got all the answers about where God is leading next or what God is up to. And, 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 and he's not going to pretend to have them. And we don't really like that, do we? There's enough confusion in the world today. We want a sure and simple answer. We want a quick fix to problems. We want to know what will work before we do it. But an awful lot of the tough challenges in life require us to follow Jesus into uncharted territory and take on things we don't know how we're going to do. And there's no shame in that. Paul says, that's normal for me. There, there's no shame in learning as we go. That's often what following Jesus looks like. His strength, our weakness. His wisdom, our willingness. Treasure in jars of clay. And he tells them there's more. Not only is there pressure and perplexity to this life in Christ sometimes, but sometimes there's outright persecution too. The word Paul uses here literally means to be stalked like an animal by a hunter. So if you're a hunter, imagine you're prey. You know, you're out in your deer stand or whatever, or you've baited for a bear and you're, or, or you're calling in a turkey and, you know, you're intent on, uh, on getting that thing and hunting it down. And Paul pictures himself as hounded and hunting down, hunted down. And he didn't do anything to deserve it, just like the turkey you're after. In other words, <laughs> there are people who are just playing out to get him. And he's asking, what have they got against me? Ever ask that question of God? Why is this happening? <laughs> have you ever been in a situation where you prayed, Lord, what did I do to deserve this? Why are they out to get me? What have I done to them? And just when we think that's plenty to handle, he cranks it up one final notch, and we're just going to call it pulverized so that we can remember it, and it starts with a P, but he says we're struck down. We're struck down. Paul says sometimes he's struck down, which we think in our language probably means um, really, really depressed. It literally meant whacked with a weapon. And the idea seems to be that the will to go on is nearly beaten out of us sometimes. You ever experienced that one? Paul has been literally left for dead, of course, remember? And he was struck down so many times verbally and emotionally and socially. He'd taken what we would say is a lot of mortar fire. And apart from God's grace, he surely experienced situations in, when, in which he thought, I just can't go on. Maybe he even thought, I don't know if I want to go on. 
I don't know if you've ever been there. I know for sure I have. He must have prayed about these things. Lord, I'm, the pressure's so great and I'm so confused and, and it seems like people are out to get me and sometimes I just wonder if I can go on. And he says all of this is part of the normal Christian life. And I think we need to hear that and we need to remember that. We have life reasonably easy, really, in our times. Philip Yancey, in his second book about where is God when it hurts, and I don't remember the title, says, do you know that until a couple hundred years ago, one half of babies died before reaching the age of five? And the average life adult expectancy was something like 35 years old? Or have you noticed that two-thirds of the Psalms, two-thirds of the content that's there is a lament, a cry out to God for help from hurting people. And all of this is part of the normal Christian life, except, except that that's just the jar of clay side of the equation. And there's also the treasure Along with every one of these gut-wrenching problems is a significant but not. Do you see them? But not, but not, but not, but not. He's demonstrated that, that he really is just a jar of clay, but the but not is evidence of the all-surpassing power that's from God. And so he says, I'm under pressure, but crushed. I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I'm persecuted, but I'm not abandoned. I'm struck down, but I am not destroyed. His pressured weakness was met with God's power. He was squeezed, but not squashed. Bewildered but not befuddled. We could think of lots of them, couldn't we? Knocked down but not knocked out. I, I, like, I like that. He was nearly at the end of his rope, but he was never anywhere near the end of hope in Christ. Never, ever abandoned by God. And that is the normal Christian life. What Paul had discovered is, is when God says, I'm going to be with you in your afflictions, when the Father calls Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, not until you get to the cross do you realize just how far he's going to be with us in our affliction. And Jesus didn't just suffer what we suffer. And the cross, his sufferings went way beyond just the physical. He was experiencing everything that all of us deserve for all our collective sin. And even though the cross doesn't tell us the answer to our why me question, the cross doesn't tell us why God chooses to let some people suffer in some ways and spares others. The, the, the cross doesn't give us all those answers we clamor for. It does tell us clearly what the answer isn't. It tells us what the answer can't be. It can't be that God doesn't, it can't be that God doesn't care. We don't know why he allows suffering, but we do know it can't be that God is remote or indifferent because he's plunged himself into our suffering infinitely beyond anything we will ever suffer. We do know where God is when we're pressured and at our wit's end and persecuted and ready to just give up. He's right there with us and he hasn't forgotten us or looked the other way and he's not distant from our pain. So then, what we have here isn't some kind of armchair theology, is it? It's what we need for faithful life in the trenches. And we're left especially, I think, with two things by this passage. Two big ideas. First, our faith and the values of this world are on a collision course. We need to take a hard look at what God really does promise us. 
lots of grace, fullness of joy, a peace that passes understanding, and the possibility of pain and suffering and disappointments. See, if we expect hard times might come, we're not shocked senseless when they do. For some people, anything less than peace and prosperity and health, at least most of the time, becomes a source of disappointment with God. We need to remind ourselves that enduring with praise, not avoiding pain, is the real evidence that the, not avoiding pain is the real evidence that the kingdom of God is here. Let me put it this way: anyone can worship Santa Claus. Do you get that? Anyone can worship Santa Claus. But the greatest testimony to God's power comes from our trusting him in the midst of heartbreaking hardships. Because we're convinced that our good and God's glory coincide perfectly. And so it starts with our biblical expectations, but then it goes beyond that. The, the other reason Paul keeps on when he's nearly ready to give up is his utter and complete dependence and confidence in the resurrection. He knows the treasure within him is powerful and permanent and victorious. Even death will be swallowed up in Jesus' victory. And you know what that means? It doesn't mean death and suffering just stop. It means all swallowed up, taken into the victory. And so nothing is for nothing. And there's a day, and it's begun already when it will and it, and it will come fully when, when Jesus returns, when all we've endured seems, in comparison, somehow light and momentary, as hard as that is for us to imagine, in comparison to the weight of the glory awaiting for us, uh, us that, that will go on forever and ever. Nothing's irredeemable. And when Christians suffer, we too, like Paul, can take courage from the fact that our lives might demonstrate to others the power of the resurrection transformation that Jesus brings and the fact of the reward that awaits us in his eternal kingdom. Life is hard often, even with Jesus. Sometimes, especially when we faithfully follow him, and it's easy to lose heart, and sometimes we may just want to quit. We've all faced problems in our relationships and in our work that have caused us to want to think about laying down the tools and walking away. Instead of giving up when persecution and painful problems wore him down, Paul allowed the Spirit to strengthen him. Don't let weariness or pain or criticism force you off the job. Don't let them make you doubt God's love for you or his purpose and plan for your life. Instead, renew your commitment to serving Christ in the midst of it all. Focus on the eternal reward he promises, not the intensity of today's pain, however great it may be, and it is sometimes. Your very weakness allows the resurrection power of Jesus to strengthen you and to bless others through you. Will you be part of that? Any prayer requests as, as we pray today? I've got one already for Sandy Lowe. Um, Sandy is having uh, surgery related to breast cancer on Tuesday. Tuesday? So let's, let's pray for Sandy. Are there others? <sighs> Difficulties in life are, are sometimes so overwhelming, but God is always greater. So let's turn to the one who holds our hope in his powerful hands. Oh, Father in heaven, your name is above every name. Your reputation in our sight never begins to match the wonder of who you really are. So we do our best to, to grasp your greatness, and to honor you. You spoke and worlds came into being. You acted in a dark void and a universe burst forth. 
how can you not also care for us? You are all powerful. And you sent your son into this world to be our redeemer. When we turned our backs on you, how can you not be willing? You are so rich in mercy. Thank you for reminding us again and again in your word that your steadfast love endures forever. For that's our hope. Hallowed be thy name, Father. And we pray that just as we long for our Savior's return in your kingdom to come in its fullness and every knee to bow before Jesus and every tear to be wiped away and, and every illness to be cured and every problem in this world to be fixed and all the pollution of life to be swept away and for that to go on for an eternity. We also pray that your kingdom would come here and now and among us in the already not yet way that it does, that we would cooperate with, with what you're doing in this world, that we'd open our eyes and see it, that we'd enter in and, and take our place and, and do our part to do your work in this world. Guide us, inspire us, motivate us to that end, Lord. We pray that your will would be done and we want to be willing. But even where people are not willing, we pray that your will would be done, that, that you'd exercise your sovereignty in a way that, that we can see and know that despite all the troubles in this world, you are indeed in control. Lord, we pray that you'd continue to provide for us even as we thank you for all that we have. You have abundantly, richly blessed us. And because of this, we look to you with, with all of our needs, Father. And we pray that, that you would provide the income that, that, that some of us need in order to, to care for our own needs and minister to the needs of others. We, we pray that you would bring the, the peace to relationships that we seek. We're, we're in this sinful world, people argue and bear grudges and hurt feelings and, and we pray that you'd give us strength to, to live in a way that models the love of Jesus. And where we experience the difficulty of illness, Lord, we ask that you would come as healer. We ask that you'd give Sandy a successful surgery Tuesday. We ask that you'd strengthen and you'd heal others. And Lord, sometimes the, the problems seem like they won't go away, but you're greater than all that, and we know that you can do whatever you purpose to do. And so we lay our needs before you knowing that you care for us. And we pray that you'd forgive us, Lord, when we fail you, that you'd forgive us when we don't act with courage and faith, that you'd forgive us when we trust in everything else before we trust in you. Thank you for the gentle way that you correct us. Thank you for allowing us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's nothing we could do that, that couldn't be dealt with at the cross, that you are so willing to forgive every sin that's confessed, and Lord, help us to model that forgiveness in the lives of others. Help us to be your forgiving people as well as your forgiven people. Father, we ask that you'd wrap your arms around those hurricane victims, especially in Haiti, where they have so little and suffer so much. We pray, Lord, that you would bring understanding and love and, and goodwill to our land as we are so stuck in the mire of a presidential race. And we pray that you'd bring racial reconciliation where one group of people doesn't trust another group of people and, and help us to see that, that we're all your children, Lord. We pray that 
you would allow the gospel to be spread where all kinds of other ideologies are latched onto so quickly and, and we see the destructiveness of that. We see the, the lack of hope. We pray that you'd open our hearts to the needs of others around us. We pray that you would do all of these things for your glory knowing that our greatest good and our greatest joy and the glory you deserve coincide perfectly. Help us to live more faithfully, more resiliently for you. And we pray in the mighty and merciful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn sort of bathes us in, in the grace and the hope of Jesus Christ. So as you sing it, let, let it be that closure to some difficult things we've looked at today and, and remind you how wonderful it is that we have this kind of Savior. this place today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his peace that passes all understanding in good times and in trials. Go in peace.